This morning I'd like to remind you that God is looking for reverent men. As you turn to Titus 2, verse 2, God is on the lookout for men who are reverent. Reverence is acknowledging in your life the weight of God upon your life. A lot of times we we don't consider the the pictures of the words of the Bible. In the Old Testament, when it says we are to glorify God, or it speaks of the glory of God, in fact, I remember the first verse I ever had to uh, memorize in Hebrew, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Let's see. Hashemayim mesaprim kevodel, we la la, le la la. That's the first two lines in Hebrews. But kevod, el, is glory of God. Do you know what kivoz, English glory, means? It means the heaviness, the weightiness of God. We are supposed to, as his children, as those who have yielded to him, feel the weightiness, the mightiness of God. And that weight upon our lives should alter the way that we live. It's kind of like gravity, because I'm so consciously aware of gravity, I will not jump off high buildings, because I know that I will fall. And because I feel the weight of gravity, I do not do certain things, and because we feel the weight of God, we live differently. Getting serious about God is feeling the weightiness of God in a very amused, not thinking about God world. That's what God is looking for. Titus 2 As you open there, we're in the midst of an intense study of what God wants in men. In verse 2, God starts with the older men. As you're looking down at the text, it says that Titus is to teach the older men. We've already seen in weeks past, the Bible defines older as 50-plus-year-old men. And in the verse that follows after older men, God gives them six indicators of spiritual maturity that God wants and that God uses. This is a very pointed passage in the Word of God for men. These six choices are possible for any man who will ask and surrender to God's grace. And that surrendered obedience is called a grace-energized life. I surrender my life, yielding to His grace, and His grace energizes these responses from me because that's what I want. I want what he wants, and he brings it to pass in my life. And God asks men who want to serve him to be reverent, to be serious enough about God to do what pleases him, and also to be serious enough about God to avoid what displeases him. It's no longer a a list of rules, and it's no longer a game of, of getting caught or not. It's feeling the weight of God in every part of my life. How I talk, how I think, how I respond, what I do, how I invest my time and my treasures. It's so powerful to think of this concept. What God says in his word is clear. The Bible is the revelation from the Lord of his desires. And there's no mystery what God wants. It's plain and simple so that in the first century, the slaves and the common people who weren't even educated understood what God wanted. It it, it is so clear. The question is whether we'll respond. God has a specific desire for every believer age 50 plus. And there is no more vital scripture for every man who knows Christ personally than this verse. God asks us to either respond to him or realize that in going our own way and not his, we're wasting our lives. You want to know what the ultimate waste is? living life the way you think you should live it, rather than responding and obeying and living life the way God, in his word, has told us plainly that he wishes for us to live. And so, because God knows how strong the world and the flesh and the devil can be, he offers us a pathway, a way to live through life. These six elements that he gives, the six character qualities, are a way to live through life to maximize our rapidly passing days. How can godly men keep from wasting the most precious years of their life? By grabbing on to the grace-energized changes that God wants to make. And where does he make those? He makes them inside of us. Only grace can reach inside of us. Only God can tune us up and repair and renew and make us his on the inside. 
so that those changes begin to show to our wives and our children and our families and those around us at work. God wants us to be a man that he can use to maximize his kingdom, to accomplish his purposes, and fulfill his plan. We've come to the second of the six qualities. The first one is that word just before reverent. Uh, That first word, it says teach, in verse 2, the older men to be sober. We saw that that is maintaining a balance in life. Having a balanced life in a, in a world that is totally out of balance is the Greek word nephalios. And God wants a matured, godly, older man. And he wants him to live a life that exemplifies Christ, that has this balance, this, this, this stability, as everything else is, is very unstable in life. And these men, these godly, older, sober men, are to model a life that God wants. And they specifically encourage younger men. And this godly older man, this 50-plus-year-old man, has as his desire to find a younger man and to exemplify Christ on a personal basis. In fact, this morning I was talking to one of our Titus II women, and they gave me a brief report on a person they're discipling. And I said, you remember there's a, a concept in the Bible that speaks about how to encourage that we're supposed to encourage the faint-hearted. And the word encourage in the Greek language is para mutheo. And it means to come nearby and whisper in the ear of that one. Para alongside of mutheo to whisper. It means being close enough to someone that you can actually not email them, but you can actually talk to them. Isn't that a novel concept? Have you ever noticed in our world that people will email someone that sits four inches thick wall on the other side of a wall from them. They don't get up, wheel the chair back, walk around, and stick their head in. They what? They shoot off an electronic digital message, and we've lost the para mutheo even in spiritual life. It comes by lives invested in lives. Lives that stop something else and make a space to bring another life alongside and to actually walk through life together with that person. That's what these godly, older, sober men do. And these older men, as they're alongside of a younger man, challenge the younger one to abandon the temptations of youth. Why? Because the older man has already gone through that and knows how empty and fruitless they are. And they encourage the younger men to to abandon reckless living or impatience with decision-making or thoughtless communication or being unreliable, which is one of the characteristics often of youth. Well, when we get to the second quality, look in verse 2. It says not only are they to be sober, but it says in the New King James, reverent. Now, the King James calls it grave. So if you see that in your Bible, that's the word we're looking at. Uh, The New International uh, says worthy of respect. So if that's in your Bible, that's what we're looking at this morning. New American calls it dignified. But this word communicates getting serious about God in a world that's not. In a world that's amused. Getting serious means to muse and feel the weight of God. Ah, amusement means to not feel God's weight and not to think about what God thinks. We live in a world that is godless and not thinking about God. He doesn't even figure in the equation. And we're supposed to go through life feeling the weight of God's control and desire and mandate upon our life. That's what this word is all about. The word is semnas, and God wants older men to model what it's like to live life seriously for God. These men think deeply about God in an amused world, in a shallow thinking culture. These men never trivialize what God says is important. These men live a life that doesn't ignore God. You see, even among believers, there's this kind of pigeonhole-like compartmentalization that we think about God here at Bible study and we think about God here maybe at rehearsal or we think about God here where you are this morning. But we don't think about God when we're doing this and we don't think about God and God doesn't have anything to do with this and that, that is what God is warning against and wants the older men to come in and, and encourage the younger men not to live those compartments but to let God's weight permeate all of your life. And that's what these men do. They teach the younger men that a life that doesn't ignore God means that they are not entertained by sensuality. You know what entertainment is? It's something you place in front of you and you watch just to relax and to enjoy. And sensuality can never be placed in front of a Christian. And we don't make lists of what sensuality is. God has already done that. 
And a person who is serious about God says, I'll never allow sensuality to entertain me. That's a sobering thought. That's what God wants. Secondly, it means that they will never be amused by vulgarity. And most comedy nowadays has a vulgar side. And so the Christian that is serious in feeling the weight of God will never allow themselves to be, to be enjoying amusement by vulgarity and doesn't treat God's word superficially. This man won't laugh at others' troubles. He will not mock their weaknesses. As an older person who has seen hardship and misfortune and injustice, life for this man who is serious and reverent is real and pain is serious and time with people is utterly important. It's someone who's gotten serious about God in their everyday life and that's what the Lord's looking for. Older men in the faith who understand the brevity of life understand also the gravity of God's word and the reality of eternity. And so these men have learned that there are dangerous distractions that godly men will always avoid. And this morning I just would like to challenge you and if you are a godly younger man, or if you're a godly woman, older or younger, or if you are just don't even know what you are, I want you to think about the dangerous distractions that God's Word warns us about. Grace-energized men who live in a sin-energized world are part of God's plan. God is on the lookout for those who are sold out and full-hearted and are willing to stay away from what will deaden their minds of Christ and their spirit-filled walk. Now, to show you what I mean, turn to 2 Timothy in your Bible. Grab your Bible. Go from Titus back one book, 2 Timothy. And I want you to just go back that one book to chapter 3. So 2 Timothy 3. And I want to read to you the first five verses and talk to you about the dangerous distractions that godly men must avoid. And basically, Paul gives an indictment on what the world is going to look like in the last days. And as we read this passage, I want you to think about how God looks at our culture that we live in and sail through each day. And what he, at the end, in verse 5, what he tells us that if we're energized by grace, we will do with all of these dangerous distractions. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Paul says to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Verse 4, traitors, heady, ha- he- traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And here's the conclusion. And from such people, and then this verb is a present, middle, imperative. Present, constantly, middle for yourself, imperative command. And look what it says. From such people, turn away. He says, I command you, be constantly turning away from that direction of life. Now, if we were to paraphrase this, I just took every translation, I have 27, and I took the best word from each of them, and this is what it says. The end of days will be filled with people who are self-absorbed, money lovers, self-promoters, contemptuous, evil speaking, disregarding parents, thankless, shameless in desires, affectionless, irreconcilable, their tongues are used by the devil, enslaved to lust, savage, good-hating, traitorous, maniacal, inflated by pride, self-worshipping, and empty-hearted. Keep yourselves away from that. Couldn't be clearer. Those are the distractions. That's the world we live in. That's what God wants us not to be like. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, I pray this morning that you would take your word through the power of your spirit and work in our hearts much like corroded arteries would be cleaned out by either drugs or some device, the areas of our life that have built up the plaque of this world, 
these dangerous distractions that make you weightless and not, not felt in our lives and our decisions need to be scraped away. That's an internal work that only your spirit can do. So I pray that you would clean us out on the insides, the arteries of our mind, the arteries of our spiritual hearts, that you would convict us of that which we must this morning repent of and keep ourselves away from that cause us not to feel the gravity of your glory in our lives. That's our heart's desire. Do your work. Glorify yourself through your word, by your spirit, in our midst today. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. You know, God said that people, 2 Timothy 3, are going to come to a point where they wouldn't take God seriously. This whole list I read, verses 1 through 5, is a world that doesn't feel any weight of God. They are God-less, they're empty-hearted, they don't even care about him. And what happens when believers live surrounded by that, it slowly seeps into our lives. And that's what Paul is warning about. The world is completely wrapped up in itself, disregarding everything God says is important, and turns away from him in sensuality and rebellion. And for centuries, the church has existed in the midst of a constantly godless world and yet in the midst of that constantly godless world has turned out incredible deep thinking powerful godly men and women but if you have noticed the current climate across America among evangelicals people that profess the name of Christ you find that the depth the commitment the longing for holiness is slowly eroding by every measure, by every survey, by every level of knowing what's going on in this world. And so you wonder, what's happening? What would cause? Uh, What spiritual enemy has sapped the church of mighty depth, especially in its men? Well, after 30 years of teaching God's word, I've watched those I teach over the years struggle with what I call the great neutralizer. Basically, it's this. When they go home from a Bible study, when they go home from a fellowship, from a class, or a worship service, they sit down in front of the single most powerfully mind-altering device of all. They sit down before the great neutralizer. And within a half hour, they've forgotten almost everything they just learned. And what is this mind-altering device? It's the images and powerful messages of today's media be it the television, uh, be it some video gaming, be it the internet or some movie, they can effectively evaporate everything they just learned and neutralize that on the spot and couldn't tell you for the life of them what they just learned because it just goes away. Professor Neil Postman, the author of a book from a decade ago called Amusing Ourselves to Death, did a study He's a Jewish uh, thinker, and he did a study of the American culture, and this is what he said is going on. And this is an unbeliever, this is a, a secular person who is just observing the erosion of our culture without seeing the bigger picture of God. He just sees people in their minds and their scores and their attention. And he reports between the ages of 6 and 18, the average American will spend fifteen to 16,000 hours in front of a television or computer, whereas they only spend 13,000 hours in school. Did you catch that? Uh, 16,000 in front of the television or computer, 13,000 in all their years of school from K-4 through graduation. So which is the bigger influence? It's just easy math to figure that out. Also, Postman says, in the first 20 years of a normal American's life, they'll see one million commercials at the rate of at least 1,000 a week. Remember, commercials are the most expensive medium. Uh, You get to the Super Bowl and and, and one 30-second or 15-second commercial can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. There are carefully crafted messages to the mind of those who hear them. And a thousand a week are going into the minds of the average American. Media's effects are infamous. People, and this is Postman, who frequently watch television have the following. A shortened attention span. I, you, you, you talk to them and their eyes are darting in every direction. They can't really listen to you for more than a few seconds because something moves and they have to watch it because they watch moving things all the time. They have reduced linguistic power. They don't finish their sentences. They can't think of words because they're so used to being communicated to and not communicating with someone. 
Postman continues, they have a limited capacity for abstraction. They can't sit and think deeply about things. Thus, if you apply this, they struggle to think about God. They struggle to talk about God. They struggle to think about heaven. They struggle to grow in Christ. What he's saying, and that's the spiritual application of what Postman discovered in the secular sense, there is a great disabling going on of the spiritual realm, which is our minds. What happens to a man whose mind is not musing? The word muse means meditate. Muse is an old word for meditating, cogitating, thinking through things. What happens to a man who's not musing upon the greatness of God? Well, a mind that doesn't get mused upon God gets amused. It begins to be carried along. It floats with the current of the world, going away from God. This doesn't mean a believer immediately goes against God. Rather, it's a slow process where the Lord has less and less influence over the priorities of that person's life. It's the condition that one person has called weightlessness. Now think about this. Think if if this is happening in your life, because this is what's happening across our country. It is one of the defining marks of our time that God has now become weightless. I do not mean by that that he is ethereal, but rather he has become unimportant. He rests upon the world so inconsequentially that he's not noticeable. He's lost his saliency for human life. Now, why would this person say that? Well, those who assure the posters of their belief in God's existence may nonetheless consider him less interesting than television. God is weightless when God is less interesting than television. When you can spend hours, just burn hour after hour of your life, and you can't remember the last time you actually savored the wonders of Christ in his word. And when you don't even really have a taste for that. That's God being weightless. Or when his commands are less authoritative than their appetites for affluence and influence. Or his judgments, God's judgments, are no more awe-inspiring than the evening news. And God's truth is less compelling than an advertiser's sweet fog of flattery and lies. That's weightlessness. It's a condition we have assigned to God after having nudged him out into the periphery of our secularized life. Weightlessness tells us nothing about God, but everything about ourselves, about our condition, and about our psychological disposition to exclude God from our reality. Is God weightless in your life, or are you reverent? Do you feel the weight of God upon every part of your life, upon every thought, upon every word, upon every plan, upon every place you take this walking around temple that he lives in? Do you feel the weight of God upon how you drive and how you invest and how you spend and how you think and how you talk about people and to people and with people? Or is God weightless? God becomes weightless because we are drowning out the Holy Spirit's voice. I really think that that what is happening in my generation is the Holy Spirit's voice is getting drowned out in the lives of God's church. There's just so many voices that his voice is just one out there of the many, and it's not the loudest. God speaks to us through his word in what the Bible describes as a still, small voice. God doesn't shout. He doesn't push. He whispers. He waits. And what effect does a daily media exposure have upon our mind? One word, desensitization. We can't, it drowns him out. We can't hear him anymore. Our culture keeps testing the waters and bringing new immoral depths to the screens of America. And all the while, those watching are becoming desensitized. And when that happens, we are headed away from God. If your mind is being exposed to constant deadly spiritual viruses via digital media, consider the effects. Okay, if you were going in to the doctor and the doctor says, uh-huh, you're working around mercury, uh-huh, you're working around asbestos, uh-huh, you're working around carcinogens, well, if you continue at the current exposure rate, this is going to happen. That's a medical diagnosis. Think of a spiritual diagnosis. Number one, if you watch godlessness, it will callous you to not seek godliness. If you watch godlessness, and if you can let godlessness entertain and amuse you, 
it will cause you to not want to seek God likeness because it's no man can serve two masters either he will hold to the one and despise the other or remember the whole concept either you will be amused by one and ignore the other that's the danger of watching godlessness you watch sensuality it will defile you away from holiness sensuality is mutually exclusive to holiness a holy person feels the weight of God so much that if they even feel that a sensual realm is being entered, they're starting to back away from it. They don't go toward it. They, as it said in our Timothy passage, they turn themselves away constantly from anything that will defile or displease God. If you watch violence, it will desensitize you to neglect Christ's likeness because we know that God over and over has said that gratuitous violence and bloodshed offends him. New Testament word grieves his Holy Spirit. We're a culture that thrives on violence. We love rock em, sock em, knock up, blast em, you know, beat the bad guys, blow em up kind of stuff. And we are so American in our entertainment that we forget it's in a compartment. That compartment is just, yeah, what's wrong with you? We just got to relax and let our hair down if we have hair. And just, you know, and, and just sit back and watch that. And what happens is it slowly seeps into our life that we enjoy violence and bloodshed. And we forget God doesn't. You watch violence, it will desensitize you, and you will neglect Christ's likeness. You watch evil, it will distance you from God. Thou art of pure eyes, and to behold evil, God says. He doesn't like us to behold evil. If you watch worldliness, it will discourage your appetite for God's word. If you watch Satan's mind, you forfeit Christ's mind in you. I want to affirm and repeat what one dear pastor in Chicago said a generation ago. He said this, I'm aware of the wise warnings against using words like all, every, and always in what I say. When you absolutize your pronouncement, it's dangerous, but I'm going to do it anyway. He was a bold man. This is what he said. This is what he said in 1990. 1990? That's when we had dial-up connections. Uh, I mean, that's when no one ever heard of streaming video. Now listen to what he says. It is impossible. For any Christian who spends the bulk of his evening, month after month, week upon week, day in and day out, watching major television networks. He didn't even know about cable and the internet and all that stuff. He just was talking about TV. To have a Christian mind. You notice what he said? It's impossible for any Christian to have a Christian mind that regularly on a daily basis watches Just mainline, not cable, not pay-per-view, just normal television. This is always true of all Christians in every situation. A biblical mental program cannot coexist with a worldly programming schedule. Interesting. Today, we need to choose to cultivate the mind of Christ that God has willed us to have. There has never been a more crucial time. Why? Why? Because we're facing every day what I call a tsunami of sin. Do you remember that? It was a couple years ago, wasn't it? The big tsunami over in Indonesia and in Bali High or wherever it was. I remember some island out there. 200,000 people killed. Do you remember watching it? They finally got all the... And all of a sudden everyone was on the beach and that wave just went... It was unbelievable. Did you know there's a tsunami of sin that washes over us every day you just go out and walk through the world and you you and i are just just hit by this wave of sin neil postman said this right now television has a culture by its throat he wrote that 15 years ago right now media every form whether it be the streaming on your cell phone or whether it be your computer or whether it be your television or whether it be your whatever form the media comes It has a culture by the throat. According to an article recently in Time magazine, the average viewer sees more than 9,000 scenes of suggested immorality on primetime TV in one year. If you just watch primetime, which I guess is like 7 to 9 or 10, on a regular basis, you'll see 9,000 immoral scenes. You know what that does after a while? You say, well, that's not as bad as this. They didn't show that. Well, they only did a little of that. And see, what happens is the, the, just the sheer volume causes us to lessen God's standard. 
And is music any better? No, according to media analysts, secular music is filled with violence, the occult, rebellion, drug abuse, promiscuity, homosexuality. Those are constant themes that said in the U.S. News and World Report. If you couple that to the fact that most teens listen to an estimated 10,500 hours of rock music between the 7th and 12th grades. That's a lot in those five years. That's like the whole working time. That means they're just listening all the time, 2,000 hours a year. And to think of that, that 10,500 hours is only 500 hours less than the time they'll spend in school in grades 1 through 12. So they've been more educated by the, the music that they've heard than they have by the school they've been in, wherever that was. We are being swept away by a society that, like the fool in Psalm 14.1, believes that there is no God. I'm not describing these evils so you all go home and crash your computer and burn your TV and go hide in the mountains like the cult in Russia is doing, or was over the weekend in that cave. Rather, it's to give you a sampling of the powerful tsunami of godlessness we're all contending with daily. In the years ahead, we are moving into a time when the fictional world of human imagination is where most people will live a lot of the time. Do you realize that? Do you realize where this whole electronic thing is going? It's getting better and better and better at creating things that aren't true. And, and it's so, so powerful a medium that it's hard to, to differentiate between what's true and what's not. In fact, even here in our Sunday school, when they're teaching Sunday school, if the Sunday school teacher says something that, that the Disney movie on Joseph didn't do, the kids question, they say, well, wait a minute. When I saw Joseph, you know, the prince of Egypt, it, and they go, well, are you talking about the Disney movie? Yeah. Well, that isn't from the Bible. Oh. But the Disney movie, they know better than the Bible. That doesn't mean go burn all your Disney movies. It means realize the tsunami, the powerful effect. And what needs to start is not to ban the television from the children. It's ban the television from the adults. Because they are the ones shaping the children. And they are not serious in feeling the weight of God. Well, continuing... Our virtual reality systems electronically allow us to lie back and experience the heavenly pleasures of sight and sound in a snug electronic nest. You know, people are increasingly... Uh, I remember when I was in seminary at Dallas, a good friend of mine had the first system I'd ever seen was surround sound, and he was so excited. He put my chair in the middle of his living room, and he had one of those... Now, this was 15 years ago, and it was primitive. But he had a big screen projector, and he had speakers so that you would hear... It was Top Gun back then. You would hear the plane here, and then you heard it here, and then you heard it there. And it almost made you turn around because it was so real. That is so archaic compared to what we have now. We live in our little snug electronic nests. The real world is almost completely blotted out from our experience because we spend so much time in virtual reality in fictional worlds of human imagination. Movies continue their slide in the direction of violence and nudity and objectionable language. Many blockbuster movies now have elements of all three and the tendency in this direction is mainstreamed and hardly elicits a yawn. Children at younger and younger ages are drawn into the movie video habit, especially with the common use of videos for babysitting. As parents become more overloaded, it's simply too tempting to not just put a video on, place the children in front of the set, and they are well-behaved and even entranced. And as for the busy, stressed-out, exhausted parents, there's nothing more attractive than quiet children, unless we consider what that's doing to them and doing to us. We need to consider the spiritual effects of media exposure. The ocean of media we sail through each day is slowly seeping into our spiritual operating systems. Before our eyes, in the last generation, the media has changed societal thought and behavior profoundly. We're starting to experience things globally. We have group events now with everybody on the planet. Just like 9-11 was a global event, more and more entertainment and sporting and every other event are becoming global. There's a global consciousness now of events. A Christian doctor in Florida wrote down a list. He said, media resets the moral acceptability threshold. In other words, what used to offend us doesn't anymore. That's all that means. Media resets our shock threshold. Used to be people would go, <gasps> they don't do that anymore. 
It doesn't shock. Nothing shocks. Nothing shocks eight-year-olds. You can talk to them about anything. They already know it. It's just they've, they've had it. Media resets the boredom threshold. Children who are used to watching media on a regular basis feel lonely only a few moments after the absence of the media. It's become their world, and if you stop it, you've taken their world away from them. And it's so hard. This doctor says media results in addictive behavior. It's culturally acceptable to use media to keep kids' attention so that from their earliest memory, children are conditioned to watch, enjoy, and want movies and music and gaming. And because media has come to define their world, just taking it away is like having their world taken away. And the absence of media makes people feel like nothing is left because media has become intertwined with their relationships, comforts, enjoyments, and security. Finally, this doctor said, increased exposure to immorality comes through media. The pervasiveness of media leads to an almost unavoidable exposure to sexually explicit material at ever younger ages. Teenagers watch an average of three hours of TV per day. They listen to music for an additional one or two hours. They often have access to R-rated movies and even pornography long before they become adults. That is so common nowadays. Add to that the thousands of commercials every year the teenagers in America see. They have a constant message. The message is, sex is fun, sex is sexy, everyone out there is having sex but you. What's wrong with you? And you have a dominating influence on their lives. Well, the question is, if this tsunami of sin crashes across us each day, eroding God's word from our lives, and bits of evil are seeping in here and there, every man needs to ask himself, how can I reverse this erosion of a spirit-filled mind? If that tsunami is hitting me every day, from the billboards, from the radio, from the television, from my computer screen, from every media that I come in contact with, even, uh, you know, wholesome sports has to be filled with dancing girls and, and advertisements. You know what I mean? You just can't, you can't have one without the, the frame around it. The only way to cultivate a mind, Colossians 3, and this is where we're going to end this morning. Colossians chapter 3, turn there with me. And this is going to be just an introduction of where we're going to pick up, Lord willing, next Sunday morning. We're going to look at how to reverse the erosion of this mind that gets serious about God. God, God calls us to be reverent. That reverence is eroding by our media. It's not the communists that are going to get us, and it's not the Islamists that are going to get us. It's the media that's already got us by the throat. And it's progressively erasing God's weight from our lives. The only way to cultivate a spirit-filled life, a word-filled mind, is obedience to God's command. And Colossians 3, verse 5, tells us this. Therefore, Colossians 3, 5, put to death your members which are on the earth, Put to death fornication. Don't watch it. Don't do it. Don't think about it. Don't collect it. Don't have it in your movies. Don't have it in anything. Don't have it sung about. Don't have it portrayed. Don't have it prepared in, in advertisements that allure you that way. Put to death in your members. Your members are your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, your appetites, every part, everything that makes you up, the total you, put to death in you these things. Fornication. Fornication is any sexual activity between two people that aren't married. So don't watch sexual activity between two people that aren't married. Don't go to places where there's... You know what I mean? It's just, it's just it's very simple. Don't, don't go to things that elicit desires. Jesus said if you lust after a woman, it's as if you've already committed the sin with her. Don't be involved at looking at or around or hearing about things that elicit fornication. Or uncleanness. Uncleanness is just all the rest. That, that whole garbage way. It's just the whole... Uh, impurity of this world mortify receiving uncleanness don't be comfortable around it don't know the content of every movie don't know all the the horrible gross bestial things that are done just don't have just mortify put it to death put get out of the being aware of uncleanness and being comfortable around it and passion and evil desire and covetousness which is idolatry 
I mean, we're not just talking about gross immorality here. We're talking about salivating over the newest model cars or salivating over the newest fashion clothes or salivating over looking prettier than someone else, which is this covetous desire, this idolatry that things have in us. Verse 8, But now you yourselves are to put off all these. Anger, wrath, and malice, and blasphemy, and filthy language out of your mouth. And goes through. To mortify, this word in verse 5, means to throttle sin, to crush it in our lives, to sap it of its strength, to pull it out by the roots, to deprive it of its influence. How do we do that? Let me just read to you what Peter tells us. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.11, he says, Abstain from fleshly lusts that war against your soul. So those who want to be reverent, abstain they just say no nope. i'm sorry yes i love you no i won't do that no i won't watch that no i won't go there no i won't be exposed to that no i will not i abstain from that because it promotes lusts which are warring against my soul peter said number one stop abstain number two he says starve the flesh cut off all the supply roots if something causes you to lust get rid of it then He says, look to Jesus. Then he says, saturate yourself with the word as you're looking at Jesus. We'll talk about the elements of this. And constantly stay in touch with God. He's the one that is able to keep you from falling. He is able to present you faultless before his presence. And there's no temptation we'll ever be faced with the rest of our life that he doesn't put a lighted exit sign over the way out that we can just say, God, help me, and we can escape. That's the way to recover an eroded mind. It starts up front with us saying, enough is enough. I'm going to fast from that media that neutralizes God. I'm going to start feeding myself on the spiritual food that strengthens God's hold on my life. I'm going to start calling out to God and saying, I want to feel your weight. I mean, as I'm walking into the 21-screen theater, I'm going to just feel crushed because I can't find a door to go in that wouldn't offend you. And so maybe I'll just go eat popcorn and sit on the lobby because there's nothing else that's worth seeing. You know, and when we start turning on the television, you just start feeling. It's just like, like someone has opened a sewer line from the BA processing plant, and it's just oozing out of the television set. And you go, ooh, I don't want that. And so all of a sudden it drives you to the pure milk of the word. And you start nurturing your souls thereby. Have you gotten serious about God? Do you feel his weight? You live in a world that God is weightless. And God's looking for men who will be reverent. Who will feel his weight on their lives. And turn other young men to likewise feel his weight on their lives. Let's bow before him this morning in prayer. Father, with Titus, I pray that you would teach the 50-plus-year-old men in this church to be reverent. I pray that they would feel your weight of your glory, that we would acknowledge the weight of your glory in our lives, and that we would abstain and turn away from those distractions that are erasing and neutralizing and drowning out the still small voice of your spirit through your word. And I pray that there would be some conscious choices made this morning, that there would be repenting of an inordinate desire for the world. And I pray that there would be some conscious choices made crying out to you that you would reverse this erosion and that you would give us back a hunger and a thirst for your word and your righteousness and that as that happens that we would reach out to those who are swirling in the tsunami around us and one by one whisper in their ears encouragement and bring them back to their senses and that they would join us in hating evil We want to seek your rule in our life, your gravity over all of our actions, and your righteousness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.